Hello everyone. Today we will discuss quantization. In the last class we have discussed sampling which is an essential part of digitizing a, an analog signal. If we have an analog signal if you want to store or transmit the signal by digital means we need to represent a finite interval the signal in any finite interval using finite number of bits. And for doing that first of all we have to take only finite number of samples or values in any given finite amount of time and thus the need for discretizing in time that is sampling. And now we are going to discuss the next essential part of digitizing an analog signal that is quantization where we discretize the signal in amplitude. So, the first of all we do sampling and then the samples are each sample is represented by finite number of bits. So, for doing that we have to select only finite number of levels in the amplitude and we cannot uh, store or transmit all possible amplitude values. So, let us say we have this is the amplitude scale and we have this is 0 and we choose a finite number of points from here that we will represent using bits. Let us say this point, this point, this point and this point, these 4 points. So, whatever is the value of the sample let us say something here, we will choose the nearest level that we want we can code. So, we will choose this point and store the corresponding bits. So, we can express this level by 0 0, this by 0 1, this by 1 0 and this level by 1 1. So, if we have uh, this amplitude, we will simply store or uh, transmit 1 0. So, by doing this obviously, there is a loss in terms of error. So, uh, why is that? Because the actual value of the signal of the sample is this point, whereas the receiver has no way of knowing what the actual value was, but it can only see this level. So, this is the error. So, if we denote the actual sample value at the nth time, that is, a x, if x n is the nth sample and x n tilde is the quantized value, quantized level for x n, then x n tilde is x n plus some quantization noise. So, this part is called quantization noise. Okay. Now, we can choose these levels in different ways. The most simple way to choose these levels is called uniform quantizer. If you choose an uniform quantizer in such a way that we can we want to store the sample values by say r number of bits, then we can choose 2 power r number of levels. So, for example, here in this example we have taken 2 bits and so there are 2 power 2 which is uh, 4, there are 4 levels. Okay. So, if we have 2 power r number of levels, the we will have a certain delta. So, how the uniform quantizer basically means that the gap between the consecutive levels is fixed. So, if uh, that is the example taken here. So, the difference between the consecutive levels is uniform that is why the quantizer is called uniform. If delta is the step size of the quantization, And if delta is small enough and the probability density function of the uh, sample is 
is smooth enough, then we can see that the density function of the quantization noise q n will be almost uniform. If we of course, exclude the boundary regions. Now, if we have uh, this quantization noise uh, density in the range of minus delta by 2 to delta by 2, then what is the expected value of the uh, energy of the noise that is delta square by 12. This can be verified by computing using this uh, uniform density function. So, this is the mean square error for an uniform quantizer. Now, we can also design non uniform quantizer and often that is all very useful, because many practical sources have values which are dense which have probably density function high in certain regions and uh, low in certain other regions, because the density function often is not uniform. For example, speech signal, speech signal uh, is more likely to take small value than high values. So, for such a signal we need to quantize using smaller step size in the high probability regions and bigger step size in the low probability regions, because that is what will minimize the error, the mean square error. Okay. So, what is desired is smaller step size in high probability region. And we will see a simple way of doing this quantization using uniform quantizer itself. So, let us say we choose a certain set of levels for a particular source. Let us say we want to choose uh, this is 0 and let us consider a signal like speech signal, which takes small values with high probability and high values with small probability. Then we want to quantize the small values with uh, dense levels and high values with sparse levels. So, let the levels be like this, these are the levels. So, we are considering here 8 levels. So, we can code the quantized signal using 3 bits. And we can do this quantization in the following way. Let us consider a uniform quantizer on the other hand. These are the levels at which we want to quantize the input signal, but let us also consider a uniform quantizer. How will it quantize? It will quantize at a uh, fixed step size. So, let the step size be like this. Let us take eight, 8 such levels. Okay. So, the input signal takes values in this x axis. Let us say x is the input sample value and we want to transform this x in such a way that this level, this value becomes this value. The first level on the x axis becomes the first level on the y axis. So, if we want to draw the characteristic of the device through which we will pass x, that should transform this value 
to this value. So, this is the input output characteristic of the device through which we will pass the sample value and then do uniform quantization. So, it will transform this value to this value, then this value this is the second uh, level to the second level of the uniform quantizer that is this is also a point on the uh, transfer characteristic. Similarly, you get all the other points So, if you join these points, we get something like this and we will see that if you had more points, it will go like this. So, this is the input output. characteristic of a device that we will use for doing this non-uniform non quantization. So, we have the uh, sample value x to be quantized, we pass it through a non-linear device which will convert this value x to a value y uh, based on this characteristic and then we will do uniform quantization on y and transmit the uh, coded bits accordingly. Now, the advantage here is that we do not have to uh, the, the, the non-uniform quantizer becomes very simple to implement this is fully for implementational uh, point of view. So, the block diagram of the quantizer will be like this that x is passed through a nonlinear device the device is obviously nonlinear because this uh, which is very clear from the plot of its characteristic and then this is passed through a uniform quantizer So, here we see that given any set of desired levels for the non-uniform quantizer, we can implement it using such a block diagram using a non-uniform quantizer, uh, using a uniform quantizer and a suitable non-linear device. Now, if we observe this, uh, this characteristic of the device we see that it actually compresses the signal. It takes the signal and compresses the high values. It, it, it uh, amplifies the low values, small values of the signal and, and attenuates the high valued uh, signal and then does uniform quantization. So, this is called this device is called compressor device because it compresses the input signal. And then the how, how do we do the uh, how do we recover the original signal back? We cannot recover it fully because of course, there is quantization noise, but how do we at least get the uh, from these values how do we get these values? We have to pass it through the inverse device and the transfer characteristic of that will be like this. If we draw only the positive the, the first quadrant of the plot, the compressor's characteristic is like this. This is x, this is y. So, the obviously, the inverse will be like this. 
So, at the receiver or at the decoder, we will simply pass the signal through first of all, we will convert the bits into levels of the uniform quantizer. So, that is the uh, and then that is passed through another nonlinear device, which is inverse of that which is present at the transmitter. So, we can we see that any non uniform quantizer can be implemented in terms of a nonlinear device and a uniform quantizer. Now, there are some uh, very useful compressors that are used in practice. Most of the times the compressor is logarithmic in nature. There is reason for this which we will not discuss in this class. Before we discuss logarithmic compressor, from these plots one can see that this is the inverse of the compressor. So, this is called expander. This is compressor and that is expander. And uh, so, these two combined is called compander. And this, this procedure is called compending. So, this method of uh, this method of doing non uniform quantization for uh, signals like speech signal for which the low values are more probable than the high values, this method is called compender. Okay, so, now let us come back to logarithmic compressor. There are two different standards for this compressor, logarithmic compressor. One is mu law compressor, which is used in the USA and Canada and another which is called A law compressor, which is used in Europe. Th these variables mu and a are simply because uh, those are uh, mu is the name of a variable which is used in the expression of the uh, characteristic of the compressor. So, the characteristic of the mu law compressor is this. So, a variable called mu appears in this expression and so this uh, is called mu law compressor. Of course, we can take we can give uh, we can name this variable anything else and call it uh, some other way, but that is the way it is named traditionally. And if we uh, plot these characteristics for different values of mu, they will look like this. we plot again only the first quadrant. For mu equal to 0, we will get no compression that is the characteristic will be linear and for mu equal as mu increases, there will be more and more compression. This is for mu equal to 10, then this is for mu equal to 100 and similarly it will keep compressing more and more as mu increases. Okay. Uh, we will not discuss the A log compressor in detail. It is similar to mu log compressor, it is also logarithmic in nature. Okay. Now, this uh, way of coding that is first quantizing the value of the sample and then representing the levels by suitable number of bits is called 
is also called PCM. This is the abbreviation for pulse coded modulation. So, important point we will note here is that each sample is coded independently of other samples. Whereas, in the schemes that we will discuss next, we will see that the coded bits for the for one sample depends on the coded uh, what the value of previous samples were. So, once a scheme is DPCM, where not the absolute value of the sample, but only the difference between the sample values, conjugative sample values is coded using finite number of bits. So, what is done is that the transmitter as well as the encoder as well as decoder both first have the initial initial value 0. Then the input signal comes, if it is greater than 0, it, it takes it takes the difference between the value of the signal and 0 and then encodes that value. Then next again another sample comes, it takes the difference between the two, two samples and then encodes the difference using finite number of bits. Another alternative is to is to uh, we will discuss that in terms of a special case that is called delta modulation. Here just like DPCM, but only one bit is used per sample. So, what is done is the transmitter has 0 in its memory, that is it initializes its encoding with the value 0, then the signal value let us say signal is like this, then it starts encoding, it sees that the sample value samples are here, these are the samples. The sample value is greater than 0, so it transmits 1 and there is a fixed step size delta. So, it transmits 1 and what does the receiver do? Receiver receives 1 and it assumes that the transmitted the, the sample at the transmitter has the value delta. If it had received 0, it would have assumed that the value is minus delta. So, there is this, but uh, this is the actual value, but the receiver assumes that the value is delta, which is let us say less than the actual value. Then it takes the next sample and it is still greater than the value that is there in the memory of the transmitter as well as the receiver. Receiver also has delta value and transmitter also keeps track of what value the receiver will keep computing. So, delta is presently there in the memory of both the transmitter and the receiver. It sees the next sample value and if it is greater than the present value at the memory, it transmits 1. If it is less than the present value in the memory, it transmits 0. So, what does the receiver do? Receiver says that for this example, um, it receives 1 and it increases the value by another delta. So, like this. Then the next value is still greater than the what is there in the memory. So, this is the value chosen. So, it keeps doing that. So, it is trying to track the original signal but because the signal is changing faster than it can track, it is not able to track it fully. Okay. So, it tracks like this. Then here it sees that the value in the memory or 
of the receiver as well as the transmitter is greater than the sample value of the signal. So, it transmits 0 and the next value becomes the present value in the memory minus delta. So, then it tries to track like this. Okay. So, there is an advantage of delta modulation when there is high correlation between the samples. That is when the samples are not changing it their values very fast. Because only when the samples are not changing very fast, the delta modulation can track its value. If for example, here the signal is changing, the slope of the signal is high and as a result, the value in the memory of the transmitter and the receiver cannot track it fully. So, how do we enforce this condition in practice? That is, we want the sample values to change slowly, so that we can do delta modulation. So, the advantage of the delta modulation is that it uses only 1 bit unlike PCM, where it uses usually 8 bits or 4 bits depending on uh, what is the resolution we want. So, here we need only 1 bit, but we need the samples to satisfy the added one extra condition that is their values should not change very fast. And we can actually impose that condition in practice by having a higher sampling frequency than Nyquist rate. So, if we take Nyquist, if you sample the signal at Nyquist rate, we have seen in the previous class that uh, it is sufficient for sampling the band limited signal, it is sufficient to recover the original signal back from the sample signal. But then if you sample at exactly Nyquist rate, what will happen is that the sample values will change arbitrarily. And as a result delta modulation will not be able to track the sample values fast enough. And for delta modulation to work, we need higher sampling frequency. And that of course, again results in higher number of bits per second, because higher sampling frequency means higher number of samples per second. And even if we have 1 bit per sample, we will end up using uh, quite a lot of bits per second. Okay. So, let us now discuss two common types of distortions that delta modulation suffer from. Let us discuss that with an, uh, with an example. Let us say the signal is like this and uh, the step size is the sampling interval is like uh, like this and the step size is of this size approximately. So, how does it track the, uh, how does the quantizer track, the, how does the delta modulator track the values of the samples? It has this value it is trying to track the value of the signal. So, the red signal is how the 
quantizer is tracking the value of the original signal. That is, this is the value in the memory of the transmitter as well as the receiver. And as we can see, there are there is a high distortion in this range where the signal is changing very fast and the quantizer is not able to track the signal value. So, this is called slope overload distortion. this happens because of high slope in the transmitted uh, in the source signal. And there is a different kind of distortion in the region where the transmitted signal is almost constant. Here the uh, here the value of the signal in the quantizer memory keeps toggling between two levels. And Ideally, it should simply settle to the uh, correct value and uh, here we see that that is not happening, but it keeps toggling between two values, keeping the actual value in the middle and that is called granular noise. So, there is a noise even when the source signal is not changing, even when the source signal is constant, there is a noise quantization noise. So, that is called granular noise. So, how do we decrease granular noise? We can decrease granular noise by decreasing the step size delta. How do we decrease slope overload distortion? To decrease slope overload distortion, we actually have to increase the step size because only then we will be able to tra track the first changing signal value. So, we have a uh, two different type of constraints to reduce granular noise and slope overload distortion. So, we have basically a conflicting interest. To decrease granular noise, we need smaller step size, whereas to decrease slope overload distortion, we need higher step size. So, the solution to this is adaptive delta modulation, where we will adapt the step size depending on the need. So, in adaptive delta modulation, the nth step size is taken as a uh, function of the previous step size and also what is the present signal value and the value in the memory of the quantizer. So, a simple adaptive delta modulation scheme is where the present step size is simply a, a factor of the uh, previous step size. So, it is it is either divided by k or multiplied by k. So, we will see how uh, it is actually E n tilde dot E n minus 1 tilde, where E n tilde and E n minus 1 tilde are the binary values that are being transmitted after delta modulating. We will discuss this in a little more detail after we discuss the block diagram of the delta modulator, where the symbols E n tilde and E n minus 1 tilde will be clear. So, this block diagram let us first see for delta equal to 1 the simple case delta equal to 1 this is a fixed step, step size delta equal to 1. So, first of course, we have the sampler and then 
we have a subtractor and this is the output is E n that is the error between the actual value of the sample and the value that is there in the memory and that is the value that is coming here. So, this is denoted we will see that this E n will be encoded using one bit. So, this is a single bit quantizer So, this is E n tilde that is the quantized value of E n it is quantized to either 1 or minus 1 and that is what is transmitted plus 1 or minus 1 you call plus 1 as 0 and minus 1 as 1 um, or whatever you can encode it using a bit. So, we have this is the value in the memory. So, what do we do in the next time instance for the next sample? We take the value in the memory and then we add 1 or minus 1 to it, 1 is the step size. So, we add 1 or subtract 1 depending on the transmitted bit. So, that is what is done here. We add this value with E n tilde and then that is the memory value that will be stored for the next sample. So, that is passed through a delay and that is the memory in the next time interval. Okay. And the receiver works just like this, it is also receiving E n tilde. So, it will just do this operation and it will get this. This is the value in the memory at the transmitter, this value is the value that the receiver also will have by doing the same operation on E n tilde. So, this is the receiver E n tilde is the input and then the signal is usually passed through a low pass filter so that uh, so as to just smooth smoothen the signal as you can see from the nature of the signal at the uh, memory of the transmitter or the receiver it is it is uh, it is rectangular small small rectangular steps. So, that needs to be smoothened and that is done by the low pass filter. So, this is how we recover the signal x n tilde hat which is also constructed reconstructed at the transmitter. So, the transmitter as well as the receiver both reconstruct this signal x tilde hat. And now, if we have adaptive delta modulator, we need to change this step size. So, it will still transmit 0 1 or plus 1 minus 1 whatever, but while doing the processing further processing it will it needs to multiply this by the step size because the step size is uh, something other than 1. So, for adaptive delta modulator we will have the same block except uh, added to another feature to it. So, this is E n tilde which is plus 1 or minus 1, but this is then scaled by the step size. and 
then the further processing is same as before. Similarly, we have to scale this uh, the, the, at the receiver also, we need to first scale the incoming value which is plus minus 1 by delta n. So, the processing is same as before except for this scaling of the input in the receiver and similarly here also at the transmitter the same as before except the scaling of the uh, output by delta n for further processing. So, how do, how do we get delta n at the receiver? The delta n at the receiver can be um, if, if getting delta n for adaptive delta modulator here requires the knowledge of the input signal, then the receiver cannot construct it from the input. So, in that case there needs to be some overhead transmission to communicate how the delta n is changing, but that is often not considered practical and usually techniques are used that, that uh, do not need extra transmission. So, where delta n can be uh, can be constructed from E n tilde itself. So, one such technique is what we were just discussing where the delta n is delta n minus 1 times a constant k power E n tilde times E n minus 1 tilde. So, what it says is, is that of course, k is a constant greater than 1. So, what it says is that if E n and E n minus 1 tilde are both same, then the previous step size is multiplied by k and if E n tilde and E n minus 1 tilde are different, then it is divided by k. So, uh, what is the reason for that? The reason is let us consider the slope overload distortion and granular noise. Here we see that uh, when the signal value is almost constant, there is granular noise. The E n is changing its sign in every sample. So, when it is doing that E n tilde times E n minus 1 tilde will be minus 1 and if it is minus 1 it the step size will be divided by k that is the present step size will be smaller than the previous step size and that means it will minimize the granular noise because it is decreasing the step size when it is required. So, to reduce to reduce granular noise we need to decrease the step size and that is what is happening using this scheme using this scheme and let us now consider the slope overload distortion here since the signal is changing at a higher rate at a higher slope the e n tilde is not changing either it is 1 for quite some time or minus 1 for quite some time if the signal is changing in the positive direction at a higher slope then E n is E n tilde is 1 for quite some time. If it is changing in the negative direction, then E n tilde will be minus 1 for some time. In either case, E n tilde times E n minus 1 tilde will be 1 and as a result, the step size will be 
multiplied by k which is greater than 1 and as a result the step size will keep increasing. So, the idea is that if the quantizer sees that the signal value is uh, constantly higher than the value in the memory or constantly lower than the signal in the memory, it needs to increase the step size, so as to track the signal value. The present step size is not sufficient, so it is increasing the step size, whereas if the, if the, uh, if it sees that the signal value is uh, greater in one sample and in the next instance it is smaller and so on. It is changing in every, every sampling instance. Then it knows that the signal is not changing fast, it is almost constant and so to be able to track it better it needs to decrease the step size, so as to minimize granular noise. So, it is trying to improve it is trying to reduce granular noise as well as slope overload distortion by changing the step size in this fashion. Okay. So, in uh, today's class we have discussed quantization, we have discussed first uniform quantizer where the uh, levels are chosen uniformly keeping the gap between consecutive levels fixed and we have seen that the uh, mean, mean square error, mean square quantization error will be delta square by 12 where delta is the step size and as a result as one can expect the mean square error is uh, less when the step size is small and it is more if the step size is large. And uniform quantizer is not the best quantizer for many source uh, practical source signals. Uh, for example, speech, speech signal takes smaller values with high probability and as a result it will be better to have dense levels in the near 0 region and sparse levels away from 0, so that the mean square error is reduced, because the values that are more frequent those values should be quantized at a dense uh, using dense levels. And we have seen that any non-uniform quantization can be done by using a non-linear device and a uniform quantizer. First, uh, a non-linear device can be designed so that the non-uniform quantization can be done by first passing the sample value through the non-linear device and then doing uniform quantization. And for signals like speech signal for which the lower values are more probable and the higher values are less probable, the nonlinear device will do some compression. It will attenuate the high values and amplify the low values and then the uniform quantizer will do its job. So, this nonlinear device will be a compressor for signals like speech signal and the uh, inverse device which will be used for uh, used at the receiver will do the expansion to get the original signal back. And um, so, the compressor and expander will be used at the transmitter and the receiver respectively and this whole operation is called compounding. And then we have discussed adaptive delta modulation for avoiding or for minimizing granular noise and slope overload distortion. We have seen that to reduce granular noise we need to have smaller step size, whereas to reduce slope overload distortion we need to have higher step size. Now, to meet both ends we need to reduce the step size when 
needed and uh, increase the step size when needed and that is exactly what is done in adaptive delta modulation. Thank you.